We are going to continue on to talk about unsupervised learning and talk about another common technique for doing unsupervised learning. In fact, there's going to be three total that we're going to highlight uh, in chapter five of the book because they are commonly used. In the last section of the book, 5.3, we talked about k-means clustering, which is just a matter of picking uh, cluster centers and associating all the data with one of the two and iterating towards finding uh, uh, a good set of cluster centers, and that's what the k-means algorithm did. So they want to talk about more about uh, what's called hierarchical clustering. This is out of section 5.4 out of the book, Data-Driven Science and Engineering, Brunton and Kutz, databookudub.com. You can find many more lectures, lots of MATLAB and Python code, and a lot more uh, video lectures online. So let's talk about this unsupervised learning technique, hierarchical clustering. So it's just like it sounds, we're going to build, start taking the data and start constructing an algorithm in a hierarchical sense towards making decisions about where data sits in a cluster so that we can classify. Now again, it's unsupervised, so there are no labels. I simply give you data and your job is to provide labels for that data in some kind of uh, uh, in some kind of principled fashion. K-means did it one way. Hierarchical clustering is going to do it another way. Just like K-means, there was a decision that had to be made, which is how many clusters do you want? And in hierarchical clustering, some of that decision process uh, you can start to see how it might play out, as I'll show you in a little bit, in what we call building dendrograms. And these dendrograms contain enough information for you to potentially make principal decisions about the number of clusters you want to use in the first place. So how does hierarchical clustering work? Well, there's two forms of it. Agglomerative, <laughs> I can't even say the word. You can read it, there it is, and divisive. So the difference between these two hierarchical clusterings is, uh, is the following. Uh, in divisive, let's start, start there first. You think about all the data I give you as being one giant cluster. And what you do in the divisive method is you say, I'm going to have a principled way to now split it into two clusters, and then three, four, five. In other words, all the way down to each point being an individual cluster. Okay, so you start off with one massive cluster and you find an algorithm that splits it into n distinct clusters where you have n data points. That's divisive. The alternative to this is to instead start off with each point is its own cluster, so you have n clusters, and then start combining clusters so that you start off with n clusters and you aggregate all the way up to the top to the one super cluster. So in one case you go from bottom up, the other one you go from bottom, sorry, yeah, so bottom up and the other one you go from up to bottom, okay? So those are the two types of hierarchical cl clustering that you would have available to you. And we're mostly going to focus in on starting here with starting off with every point's a cluster and moving up and aggregating as we go. And the way we're going to do this in hierarchical clustering is we're going to have to first define some metrics. What does it mean to be close in space to another data point? So this is a really important issue because how you measure this determines a lot about how the clustering is going to happen. <coughs> now what I'm giving you here is a set of metrics. You can always just use your standard Euclidean distance, right? It's an L2 metric between two vectors, right? Xj minus X of k norm squared. Um, or actually, that's the Euclidean. The square Euclidean is with the square. There's a Manhattan distance. And this is the L1 norm. And we already talked about in chapter four, the differences about regularization using different norms, whether L2 or L1, because those metrics really matter. And here, Again, you see them showing up here. You have two norms, you have one norm, infinity norms, and then you also have this thing called the Mahalanobis distance. So these are different metrics you can use to measure how far one data point is away from another. Your choice of metric will give you, can give you, significantly different results. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And in fact, 
the choice of metrics might be exactly what you need to give you results that make sense and are meaningful. Some metrics may give you just nothing that you can really make good decisions with about your data. So I'll just leave that out there. And the hope is that you have some intuition about your data, about what metric you should use as the best for that data set. So let's talk about what's called the dendrogram. <clears throat> and this is going to be the hierarchical clustering we want to do. And I want to show this algorithm in, in sort of in its usage. And very much like k-means, you can just simply execute this algorithm. There's not much thought into it. There's no optimization. It's just simply, you know, in k-means, it, it was an iterative algorithm. And same thing here. You're just going to walk through this algorithm. And you're going to start off with all of your data points in n clusters and walk it all the way up to there's one giant cluster. OK? All right, so here's how this is going to work. Those magenta balls are your data. And what the dendrogram is going to do in the first iteration is say, out of all those balls, which two are closest? OK? So the costly part about building this dendrogram is for any point, I've got to compute my distance to all other points. OK, so that can be expensive, especially for very high dimensional data. There are faster algorithms for doing this where you only look in a neighborhood, so you don't look at the distance to all points. You just look at those around you. But first, you have to figure out who's around you to begin with. But once you have some information, you can actually cut the computation down. So in this case here, points 2 and 3 are closest together. So now what the dendrogram is going to do, or what this hierarchical clustering is going to do is to basically merge these points into a single data point. And the single data point will be at the midpoint between them. So this is the idea. So now I started off with those two points. I've now merged them into one point. I'll now have three data points, not four. Three magenta balls. And I do the same thing as before, which is I say, now what is the distance between all the data? And now, in the second iteration, you can see that this point 1 to this new joint point 2, 3 together is, in fact, the closest distance. So what I'm going to do is join those two together. So now, on the second iteration, these two here get joined together into that ball right there. So now I have two data points. And of course, there's only one distance I have to compute between them. And now I just basically take the, the midpoint, and that's now my new data point. There it is. So notice what I did. In four iterations, I started with four data points. And I ended up with one data point at the end of four iterations. Okay, So I aggregated all the way up from four to over four iterations to one. The cost of it was I had to compute distances at every round between all the points. So they could make a decision about who was closest. So again, your distance metric matters. And what I've just shown you here is something like your standard um, you know, uh, L2 metric distance between points. Okay, But you could use others. Now how to represent this in a dendrogram is I'm going to show you this picture. This is the dendrogram associated with this process. What I have here on the x-axis is the label for the data point. Data point 2, 3, 1, 4. What I first did is I merged 2 and 3. Now that merged point merged with 1. That then merged with 4. And that's just shown here in this iteration structure. So this is called a dendrogram. It shows you in a graphical form the merging process that happens in this hierarchical clustering, going from n data points to one cluster. So you know everybody's their own cluster to being one cluster. How you do the merging is just simply based upon distance, but you can represent that in a picture like this, which is called a dendrogram. And oftentimes, dendrograms are highly interpretable. That's the important thing what the dendrogram is trying to show you. In fact, I'm going to give you an example when we go some code in a minute here of what this looks like. So let's go to some code. And in fact, I'm going to do the same example I did in the k-means, which is I'm going to give you two 
distributions uh, of data. One is going to be a stretched ellipse, another is going to be just some random Gaussian distributed. And then we're going to do basically hierarchical clustering on those. All right, so let's come here, put this down. So what I want to do here is I'm going to walk through this data set here. So first of all, very much like what I did with k-means, what I'm going to do is take some training data and test data set. Because once I have the hierarchical clustering and where the cutoffs are between the hierarchies, I can use this on new data, for instance. Uh, I'm going to generate two data sets. First, I'm going to generate one distribution. A second distribution, I'm going to rotate the second distribution so it's going to look like a little Gaussian stretched, and that's going to be my data that I'm going to use here, okay? Now, once I have that data, what I'm going to start to do is start to create the dendrogram structure itself, and that's done here in the code. So let me just show you. This is the code and it's as simple as that for generating the dendrogram. So first of all, you take your, dis, your, your data. Here it is, Y3. So what I've done here is taken some of this data. In fact, I've taken 50 data points. Y3, uh, take this. P disk is probability distribution Euclidean. So what I'm going to do is this is my distance metric that I'm using. And of course, you can change out these distance metrics as you please. You can make them a Holonobis distance. You can do other kind of, uh, of distances you want. This is Y2. Use this linkage command with that new data. Again, you can put in some modifiers here. I'm using the average to create Z. And then I can define a threshold. Now, the threshold is going to tell me how many distinct clusters I want at a given threshold level. I'm going to show you the pictures here in a minute. And then you just simply take dendrogram, take this linkage data Z, color threshold, thresh. So I'm going to basically show you the thresholds in color, and I'm going to get back the metrics H and T and plot what those look like here on a dendrogram. Okay, so in fact, actually, this will plot the dendrogram for you right here. Okay. I can also take a different threshold, which is what I've done down here. My threshold down here is now at 0.25 versus 0.85, and I'll show you the difference of these look like in practice. So if you run this, you'll create your dendrogram. Let me just show you the results here. I think they show up better here in the PowerPoint slide, so I'm going to do it here. Here's your first dendrogram. What it did is took those distributions and it basically constructed this following dendrogram through hierarchical clustering. Again, you can see the joining process that happens from this low level. This is all the data and how it gets clustered to its neighboring data. Again, it goes all by distance. Whatever distance metric you pick, which was Euclidean here, it just simply says, out of all the possibilities of pairs of points, who is closest to each other? That's the first split. And then you see these bars across here tell you when these joinings happen. Now what's interesting about the structure of the dendrogram is you can see by setting that threshold it says, look, by setting a threshold I think you have two clusters, a red and a blue cluster. So it's starting to pick out how many clusters it thinks you have based upon the thresholding command. Okay, So that's what it does here. And it's a very nice representation of the data. So right away from a visual inspection point of view, not only did you see the aggregation process, but you also saw that there's sort of these two major branches where the data comes down in this hierarchy. So that tends to be fairly informative for people to start doing diagnostics on the data. Again, completely unsupervised, so you know nothing about this data, and now this is telling you something about your data. And now you can dig down on that. I could also go back to my original data, and here this, this plot is important to see how well I did. So I had two clusters of data from two distributions. And so I drew this blue line in the middle and this blue line here. All the points, the first 50 points are supposed to be from one PDF that I generated the data. The second are from a second distribution of the data. So one way to think about it is everybody below this line should belong to the first cluster, that's the truth. Everybody on the other side should belong to the upper cluster, that's the truth. 
And so you see, it actually doesn't do so bad. In fact, if you look here, there's only a data point or, that really goes above this line. It's actually, I think that's two data points or one. There's some that are close. Over here, some gets mislabeled the other way. So I have these two PDFs, two probability distribution. This was the artificial data I generated. When I do the clustering on this data, you can see it actually gets most of the labels correctly. So in a completely unsupervised way, I didn't give it any information, and it backed out information about the data I put in, which is two PDFs with two probability distributions. So this is kind of encouraging in the sense that the dendrogram is keying in on major um, pieces of the data, and it's all based upon distance metric. So that's an encouraging sign. In fact, it does quite a bit better than k-means, because k-means, remember, is trying to do centroid clustering, where this just says, whoever I'm next to is going to be who I'm going to basically partner with in a cluster. So you're more likely to get this to actually work out well uh, in many instances. You can also play with that threshold, and the thresholding will allow you to split it into more structure in the data. So for instance, by playing around with that threshold, here's a new picture of this, where every single different color here is a different cluster. So you can start playing with the threshold and saying, well, there's two major clusters, or it could be like, yeah, but there could be in the data subclusters or maybe more refined clusters that I want to get after. And the dendrogram is a very nice way to get after this. Again, completely unsupervised. It's just basically looking at your data, looking at the distance between data points, giving you some diagnostic features that you, as a supervisor, can now say, I'm going to decide on my threshold if I want two or 10 or whatever the threshold you set here will determine the number of clusters down here. Okay? So this is a very powerful tool, heavily used because it does pull out information that often is interpretable and allows you to start making smarter decisions about how you want to look at your data because it's giving you information you should actually start looking at. Okay? So this is a very important uh, one of the super unsupervised learning algorithms. So again, all the code, all the data, MATLAB and Python base can be found here at databookuw.com. Also the notes there, databookuw.com, databook.pdf. Lots more lectures, lots more results also on classification and clustering in this chapter five of this book. And we'll talk more about those next.